Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Tupper. It is Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, excuse me, <laughs> February 21st. Uh, I'm in Champaign. Uh, I don't know if you can see the assembly hall in the background or not. Um, parked outside the assembly hall, or excuse me, the <laughs> State Farm Center. Oh boy, that's good. And uh, just got done with Brad Underwood's press conference and um, was down on the floor t uh, talking to Trent Frazier for a little bit and and talking to uh, Jamal Walker for a little bit too. Um, you know, I I didn't get to watch last night's game until after the fact. I was covering uh, something here in town, uh, the final game of Millican women's coach Lori Kearns, who's a tremendous, tremendous coach and tremendous person. Uh, 32 years, won the National Division Three National Championship in 2005, the same year Illinois lost in the title game. She won the title game for, for in Division Three. And um, so I was covering that. Didn't get to see it until I got home. Um, probably saw the same things you did. Uh, I thought they played really well in the first half. Uh, you got to remember who they're playing. Um, that is one of the best teams in the country, the best team in the Big Ten, on their floor, on senior night, and they're down three at, at halftime. I thought they played really well. Um, and then the second half, it became clear, you know, the difference between the two programs right now. Um, Michigan State has a talent level and a depth of talent that is beyond anything Illinois has right now. You know, if there's two players that could be in their rotation, uh, Leron and Trent maybe. Um, <clears throat> but after that, I mean, Tom Izzo's bringing guys off the bench that started in Final Fours. Are you kidding me? N nobody does that. Uh, but he's doing it. And they're when they play, they're really really good. The only thing about them that scares me is that they don't always do it. Um, you know, we all remember the first half a week ago against Northwestern in which they were kind of sleepwalking and found themselves down by 27, came back and won, largest comeback in Big Ten history, and um, it was amazing. But um, but that's the challenge that Brad Underwood has. It's the challenge that John Gross had. It's the challenge that Lovey Smith has. And that is recruiting against programs that have way more to offer than you have to today's high school prospects. You know, um, look at Jaron Jackson. He's a freshman. He's going to leave after this year. He's going to make millions of dollars in the NBA. And someone is going to ask, well, who have you had come through your program here lately? I mean, they're not going to ask it because they're going to know. But... I'm going to say Jaron Jackson. He was here for a year. He's a millionaire in the NBA. And they're going to be recruited by Illinois. And they're going to say, well, who have you had come through? And they're going to say Malcolm Hill, who's here for four years and is playing overseas in a certain level of obscurity. Not to diminish anything Malcolm's done. You know how much I love Malcolm. But, um, man, it's hard when one team has all kinds of recent accomplishments, all kinds of recent NBA players, all kinds of recent national noise at the NCAA tournament level, and the other team has been dead silent uh, on those in those areas. And um, you know, I was talking to Trent Frazier a minute ago. And God bless that kid. John Gross's greatest gift to the Illinois program was getting Trent Frazier. Right? I mean, <clears throat> this kid's been a godsend. Somebody asked him about because when they were at Michigan State last night senior night and and one of them I think maybe they all did I didn't I didn't see that ceremony but we got down on their hands and knees and kissed the Spartan in the middle of the floor and somebody asked him will you kiss the block I in the middle of the floor on your senior night and he was like oh god he says I'll be crying and you know, I love this school so much uh, you know I can't wait to see what we do over the next four years so he's thinking four years which is it's is good um and, uh, I mean, but who competes with Jaron Jackson? You saw, you know, they had Brad mic'd up last night, one of the timeouts, and he was yelling at, at his guys, be aggressive, be aggressive. He looked at Mark Smith, be aggressive. Mark Smith got the ball. Mark Smith was aggressive. He went in, went at the basket. And reaching from way over here is this guy with a seven-and-a-half-foot wingspan or whatever Jaron Jackson's got, and just swat the ball away. Well, yeah, that, now, but how does Illinois get a Jaron Jackson? Do you know I was, when I was just talking to Jamal Walker, do you know Jamal recruited Jaron Jackson for Illinois? 
and um, before he completely blew up and the rest of the world learned, oh my gosh, this guy is an elite player and he's going to be one year in college and then, you know, a top 10 NBA pick, um, you know, so they, you know, I don't know that they, I think that's outside of their grasp right now, but how do you get the, a poor man's version of that? How do you get a poor man's Miles Bridges? How do you get a poor man's uh, Joshua Langford, you know, how do you get, they, you know, Illinois would love to have Gavin Schilling. You kidding me? Um, he comes off the bench for Michigan State. But that's the challenge. And that's the only way that I know of to bridge that glaring talent gap that we saw last night and that we've seen in a number of games and that we may well see tomorrow night when they play Purdue. I mean, I mean, Purdue's got two monsters uh, in the middle. Uh, Isaac Haas is just an enormous human being, 7'2", 290. And then Harms is is 7'3", I don't know, 250. Uh, and he blocks, he's the shot blocker. So it's just, uh, it's a dilemma. Uh, and it requires great perseverance on behalf of the coaching staff to continue to recruit and try to get these kids and and reach for the occasional jewel like a, like a Courtney Ramey um, to to get a kid that people didn't realize how good he was as Coach Gross did with uh, Trent Frazier and as they hope that they're getting on some guys as well and um, and you add Io to the mix and you you know you add some other guys and obviously they got to get some size and they really need a pure terrific three-point shooter out there I think this team's getting better uh, at this point in the schedule it's hard to identify that all the time because of who they're playing. It's it's just hard to look good 40 minutes against Michigan State, and it's probably going to be hard tomorrow night against Purdue. Although playing at home, you know, Illinois' Big Ten wins have all come at home. Um, you know, we'll, I don't know. We'll see. It's the final home game of the year. Can't believe the season's gone that quickly, but it has. And uh, then off to um, Rutgers for the game Sunday afternoon, and they will stay out east, and uh, we'll practice out there and will go to um, New York City for their first round um, Big Ten tournament game um, on almost certainly on Wednesday. And uh, we'll learn an opponent in the game time and all that stuff at some point here. But um, um, boy, any uh, particularly against Michigan State, the, the talent level is so clear. And if you go to games, or if you, if I think you need to be at them to see this so clearly as well, but the difference is visible before the long before the game ever begins. When the two key teams come on the floor, Illinois looks so much smaller than everyone else. Not just in height, but in just the the other teams look like high major college basketball teams, and Illinois looks like something a, a cut below. You know, they're starting a six foot seven inch guy in the middle, and with Michael Finke out there, at least he looked. You know, Michael Finke looked the role at six ten. They've got Ebo in in. Matisse, who you know, those guys are a couple of skinny guys, and then Purdue comes out with their seven foot plusers, and <laughs> it's just uh, it's kind of remarkable. So, um, anyhow, I don't know what to say. I wish I had, uh, you know, it would be fun to have had a game that they played better in the second half uh, against, and the game went down in the last couple of possessions. Uh, that certainly was not to be. So, um, Purdue tomorrow night, six o'clock Central Time. Rutgers Sunday, 2.30 Central Time. Big Ten Tournament, Madison Square Garden. Opening round Wednesday. Um, and, you know, I keep, I, I, I'm, I'm conditioned to say, and they'll play to the, and the Big Ten teams will play until the championship is decided on Sunday. And then about 45 minutes later, we'll unveil the bracket and the pairings and selection Sunday. Well, except this year, it'll, it'll be about, it'll be about, a week and 45 minutes later and I don't know what that's going to be like uh, that'll be weird to have a full week with no games you know Illinois will finish up uh, the same time as the Valley teams and, and the Big Ten teams will do that and and hang around and um, if I'm a coach I try to bend the message in my favor and say hey we're getting rested we're going to be able to practice we're, we've been I know in Illinois case they've been through a period here where they can't practice I mean, it's one-day prep, look at the scouting report, let's do a walkthrough, and let's jump on a plane, or let's get some rest, and then let's go. Uh, the, the 
Big Ten teams that are going to be in postseason will be able to practice, will be able to rest. Whether that is actually rust, you know, that's the question, and we'll see what happens there. But um, anyhow, uh, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it a lot. And uh, football practice starts March the 6th. First practice, we're going to be going early in the mornings. It sounds like 7, 7.30 for practice times. Holy cow. Uh, we will only get to watch, I believe, the first 30 minutes, and then we will have to disappear and return at the, at the conclusion of practice and talk to coaches and players, and, and we'll see how all that goes. So um, anyhow, have a great weekend. Um, be safe, and we'll talk to you later.